je parle peu français, je vais me poursuivre en anglais. Donc, c'est un vrai plaisir d'être ici. Dans les derniers temps, en pensant à ce travail, il y a 10 ans, j'ai eu beaucoup d'interactions avec des gens qui sont ici à l'AMU, Kim Storelny, et Peter Godfrey Smith, et avec des idées de ces gens qui ont aidé à faire des choses qui ont aidé à faire des choses qui ont aidé à faire des choses. The emergence of some of the ideas that we subsequently realized in experiment. So, uh, and, yeah, it's a pleasure to The origins of multicellularity. So, the talk is general. Um, it doesn't particularly touch on the philosophical aspects and toward the end, but there certainly are many. Um, there are also some biological details that uh, we can skip over. I mean, how, how many here have a are interested in the gory biological details of mechanism. Okay, fine. Well, there's a little bit. We can either go over that. I mean, we're quite interested in that. Otherwise, we can skip. Um, this is a study in, you know, that falls within the field of experimental evolution. Um, so what we do is to take uh, microbial populations, uh, which are effectively experimental tools, we allow them to evolve under certain ecological conditions and observe the outcome. Uh, so these experiments are necessarily uh, controlled, contrived, if you like, because we have the capacity to control ecological circumstances, which I think turns out from these experiments are central to understanding the evolution of multicellularity. Back to the beginning again, I'm sure, familiar territory, uh, the hierarchical structure of life. Uh, we see this hierarchical structure whenever we look for uh, evidence of some capacity for reproduction. So if we take this set of matrioska dolls, which represents different hierarchical levels, uh, you know, John Lennon here represents, for example, a multicellular organism. Multicellular organisms like us uh, can reproduce. We take that for granted. Uh, we are, of course, made up of cells, and cells are also uh, capable of autonomous rep replication. Um, of course, within the context of a multicellular organism, they must play by the rules of development, but nonetheless, there is some capacity for autonomous replication. Uh, if we go down inside the cells, uh, we go into organelles, mitochondria, chloroplasts, that have some capacity for autonomous replication. Uh, into the nucleus, for example. Further, we find chromosomes, which obviously replicate. Genes uh, are this subparticle, if you like, of chromosomes that also have some capacity for autonomous replication. Um, because there is replication possible at each of these different levels, and of course we could go on above to the level of perhaps, cultures, societies, and some argue even to the level of universes, uh, selection sees each of these different levels to different extents. And often, of course, what is in the interest of one level, the individual cell here, is not necessarily in the interest of the higher levels. As you would be aware, I'm sure, that one of these conflicts uh, gives rise to cancer, the fact that cells in the short term are favored for growing fast. Uh, that gives rise to a tumor that compromises the multicellular organism. So life is hierarchically structured, and the question is why. Uh, if you were designing life from scratch, uh, without knowledge of biological principles, it would be possible, I think, to, to organize it differently. Certainly in a way that uh, meant cancer, for example, was not possible. So this hierarchical structure is curious. How it comes about is unclear. If I were to pose the question in this following way, the problem seems to me almost intractable. Why would historically speaking, individual cells uh, that are existing, that are evolving, participating in the process of evolution by natural selection, give up their right to autonomous replication <coughs> and come to replicate as part of a corporate body, where they have indeed given up much of their autonomy. And this perspective, taken a little bit further in considering the distinction between soma and germline, most of our cells are soma, they're an evolutionary dead end. So, so why would individual cells 
have ended up in a situation where they are part of a corporate body where the evolutionary uh, uh, e evolution is curtailed, significantly curtailed. And here, also, what interests, um, in terms of explaining this, what, what evolutionary processes would cause these lower-level entities to be subsumed within the, the higher-level entity? So our particular focus here is, is this problem, but in the context of cells to multicellular life. So three stages that I like to present, um, because it breaks it down into simple parts. The first stage, uh, the evolution of groups. I'll go through this quickly and then some experimental studies and come back to this cartoon a number of times. But individual cells um, participating in the process of evolution by natural selection uh, for presumably ecological reasons will form um, groups. Typically there's some cost to being a member of a group. That, that, is, that is almost guaranteed if cells are living close to one another there is going to be extreme competition for resources, the pollution of the environment. There needs to be some benefit accruing to the collective for that to work. <clears throat> there are many instances where that does hold. There is, though, necessarily the problem of cheating types uh, that will take advantage, uh, expected to evolve, that will take advantage of the collective good. They are a problem. Uh, Rick Michaud um, and others have argued that uh, the solving the problem of cheats is central to understanding the evolution of multicellular life. The next stage uh, that I'll elaborate on, the evolution of individuality, takes us to this point here, where the collectives are begetting collectives, just like the single cells are begetting single cells. So if we come back here, these single cells participate in the process of evolution by natural selection because they are Darwinian individuals and members of Darwinian populations. Uh, there is necessarily, therefore, variation among members, which we take for granted, a consequence of the error-prone nature of mutation. Cells reproduce, and because of the nature of DNA, offspring resemble the parental types. And entities with these properties participate in the process of evolution by natural selection. This stage here, the evolution of the first groups, does not necessarily come with these uh, Darwinian properties. Uh, the evolution of individuality here, which gets us to this stage, is about the evolution of these Darwinian properties at this higher level of biological organization. So here we have those same properties, but now they manifest at the level of groups, or collectives. So groups beget groups, there is variation among groups, groups offspring resemble the parental type. So groups now participate in the process of evolution by natural selection. And of course, given the nature of this Darwinian machine, the output or the endpoint, some manifestation of complex multicellular life is effectively guaranteed. So to me, the challenge has been to explain the evolution of these Darwinian properties. Um, there, I think it has been common to simply assume that these Darwinian properties simply transfer at a level, but as Griezmann pointed out, uh, Reproduction, in particular, but in fact, all of these Darwinian properties need to be need to be discovered afresh. And how they are, I think, is the, the critical issue. So, the evolution of Darwinian properties is what gets us to this point. And as I say, they're on. I think it's more or less a home run. So what I think you, we'll take you through now is some uh, cartoons that depict uh, the outcome of, of um, uh, studies over many years with experimental bacterial populations. The bacteria we use is a Pseudomonas. It's a common bacterium. It's uh, found on plants. It's not a pathogen. It's a saprophyte. Uh, that bacterium, when propagated in the test tube, effectively, a microcosm, uh, undergoes uh, rapid adaptive radiation uh, one of the very many types that emerge is this wrinkly spreader type here. More important is that this uh, mutant type uh, colonizes the air liquid interface. So let me take you through uh, this in cartoon form. So these cells here, the ancestral types are non-sticky. They grow in the broth phase. Uh, the uh, wrinkly spreaders are sticky. And it's the stickiness that allows them to form this mat. So these symbols you will see in the coming slides. So here is a microcosm. Is founded uh, by a single ancestral type. 
that is non-sticky, it grows, inevitably mutations arise that generate the mat forming type. There are numerous different front mutations, well, single step mutations. I mentioned a little bit about the pathways. Please just watch me, it's a big process. Ah, okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, uh, there are many different uh, pathways by which the, the sticky type can be uh, uh, realized. Again, there are many um, biochemical genetic details that I'll skip over, but in effect, uh, mutations cause overactivation of Dig1 and make cyclases. These causes the cell to make cyclic Dig GMP, which is a sec secondary signaling molecule, which then activates various adhesive uh, substances. In this case, it's a, an acetylated cellulose polymer. Oops. Um, and this is the adhesive property. So when the cells divide, they don't separate completely. They remain stuck to one another. And it is the sticking to one another combined with the process of cell division, so growth separation, that allows the cells to do this, which is to form a bridge across the surface. So these cells are not growing. Uh, their capacity to stay here depends on interactions between the cells. Cellulose, the, the glue, is a polymer of glucose, and of course it's better to metabolize glucose uh, than excrete it. Not surprisingly, these cells grow much more slowly than these cells here. Of course, that leads to the suggestion that sh they should be eliminated by selection. They aren't. And the reason they aren't is here the collective achieves something that the individual cells can't, and that is oxygen. So the growth of this type here depletes this environment of oxygen very, very quickly. And these organisms need oxygen, they're the obligate aerobes. So in fact, their like, niche constructing activity sets the scene for the evolution of this type. Costly for these on an individual cell basis, but the collective gains advantage. That mat can become a very substantive structure. It, it does, I mean, a couple of millimeters thick, um, you know, 10 to the 10 or more cells packed into that area in a, a vial that has a diameter of around 20 millimeters. Uh, because it is costly uh, to be a member of this group, we expect to see the evolution of cheating types. We do. Uh, these grow in the uh, mat. You can see them actually with your eye. They're effectively a tumor on top of the mat. Uh, they, of course, reap all the benefits, oxygen. They pay none of the costs, the production of the glue. And they weaken the strength of the mat. Uh, the mat then... Uh, collapses, as you will see here. And this is all quantitative, uh, quantifiable in a quantitative manner. So we are, in effect, back to where we started. So single cells, simple undifferentiated groups here, these mats, the problem of cheats, and then we seem to be back here. Indeed, we haven't got to this stage at all, which to me is the challenging one. No. I, won't, I, I will mention here that you may wonder why I'm not simply suggesting fragmentation as a possible way of solving this problem. And this is something we we'll perhaps come back and talk about. But fragmentation, I'll have a little data later on, but fragmentation offers very limited possibility uh, for the Darwinian machine to manifest. There are all sorts of reasons that it doesn't work very well. So, but, but that is one possible route to solve this problem, fragmentation. But, Given the nature of multicellular life, very often, but well, almost exclusively reproduction through a single cell uh, gamete, uh, even in organisms that don't have a dedicated soma germ line, the origins of soma germ distinction is kind of also much tied up here. Also, the origins of development, you know, once you've got to this stage, development is effectively necessary. So again, fragmentation seems to me to offer limited possibilities. So, this gave rise to the possibility that there may be other ideas. <clears throat> so we were here a moment ago, the simple mat formed, the cheating types. As I mentioned in the introduction, experimental evolution allows us to control ecology in a very fine scale way. Um, here we have a boundary around these populations. It's, it's both a strength, but also can limit what we might see in the system. So here for a moment, uh, let's return to where we were. <coughs> I would like uh, to suggest that you might consider the possibility that we dissolve the bounds of these uh, microcosms and we uh, consider a lake uh, which is studded with reeds. Now these reeds here 
each stand to provide a focal point around which a map can <coughs> form. So we had a glass vial that defines the bounds. We can also have uh, a map forming around a reed, and it is bounded by the extent that it can grow out before it collapses. The weight gets too heavy, it will collapse. Okay. So keep in mind the reed uh, and the pond, and here we are, uh, a lake uh, pond with, with four reeds in it. Again, for various reasons, but including the metabolism of these types, oxygen becomes limited. There's a high probability, uh, given the mutation possibilities, that we see the emergence of a sticky type. If a sticky type can stick itself to a reed, it can form a simple group. There are four reeds here for colonization. Uh, given the ecological advantages of colonizing the reed, one would expect to see them all colonize four different groups. Given what we know about the genetics, there are many different mutational ways of getting here, so there's variation among these groups, thinking about those Darwinian characteristics. I'm also, again, directly emphasizing mutation, and I'll deal with this further in a minute, but the, the rate at which each of these groups produces the non-sticky types varies very significantly. What I've indicated here, a small mat and already a non-sticky type, an asocial type, a cheat, um, of course, if cheats arise early, they will cause the collapse of the mat early. Here, the mat is much more substantive before a cheat has arisen. So these cheats arise at this stage. Uh, because of the early nature of this one, this collective collapses. Uh, it liberates its uh, cheat. At some point later on, this much more substantive group collapses and liberates its cheats. There are now two uh, reeds available for colonization. Uh, there is every possibility that these cheats could act as the seeds, once again, of the next generation of mats. So in this scenario here, we see the, whoops, I think I just, well, you saw it. I won't go back to the thing. <laughs> so what we saw, I slide there, was one group that produced a lot of cheats ended up being the group that left the next group, ne next offspring groups, the groups themselves, did not arise, the new generation did not arise by fragmentation, but arose by virtue of the, so there's a mat, it produces the single cell types which don't stick, they're also motile, and in this particular instance we have you know, two new reeds, uh, and uh, you know, they're colonized by groups, both of which are descendants of this original group here. So what I have suggested here is the possibility that we might get life cycles emerging uh, that allow collectives to reproduce. So it's not fragmentation, it's, it's reproduction via a simple life cycle, where in fact the life cycle brings on board, in this case the cheating type, the very type that is a problem, and integrates it over a, over a different, over a longer time scale, uh, scale uh, into um, a lineage that now is given an appropriate ecology, effectively endowed with Darwinian properties. So what we saw in that previous slide is two, two groups, one which collapsed early and left very few offspring, this one that remained late and left lots of offspring, this one left no group offspring, this one left two group offspring. And it's evolutionary change now that's taking place at the level of collectives. There's every reason that selection can work on these groups. Groups vary one to another, they reproduce, and there's uh, heritability. So the idea here, again, that the problem of cheating is embraced, uh, therefore becomes solved, and it gives, importantly, and we'll touch upon this, selection now gets to see something very, very different that it's never, ever seen before. I'll come back to that. <coughs> now, by this point, um, biologists are typically jumping out of the seat, pointing out the blindingly obvious, which is what I'm suggesting here is a life cycle, and I'm suggesting that it might run by mutation. Okay, so let me just go back to this. The idea that, I mean, well, here, in our experiments, a mutation is required to go from here to here, and a mutation is required to go back to here. There is no developmental program that relies on mutation. But the idea here was that perhaps there is enough evolutionary flexibility for this to go a certain number of times, for selection to actually work on this developmental program, and if it could, 
then it ought to be refinable to the point where it comes ultimately under developmental control and moves from mutational control. So this uh, schematic here, which I won't spend any time on, but you'll see it later on, is simply to point out that given what we know about the genetic architecture underlying expression of the sticky types and the non-sticky types, there is the real, very real possibility that evolution could work with the system for a while and maybe even discover something uh, that is akin to developmental, a developmental mechanism. So what you do just see here, you see this is the outer membrane, the inner membrane, this is one signal transduction pathway, another and another. They have in common with them type 1 late cyclase in each case. These produce cyclic dye GMP. These cause overactivation of the blues. Uh, many mutations can bring this about. Now, in the years uh, subsequently, in, in this paper here from Peter Lind earlier this year, it shows another 13 different genetic routes, all of which have a dag one late cyclase within them, all of which, when mutated, can generate uh, the sticky types. So there is a huge amount of evolutionary reflexibility, if you like, underpinning the system. Uh, if you wish, uh, the paper is there. It actually looks at an altogether different problem, but it's it, you know, about the reproducibility of evolutionary trajectories. Evolution typically just follows these three pathways here. But if you eliminate these three pathways, then suddenly evolution follows these pathways. So there is extraordinary flexibility in the genome. Okay, so the experimental studies then designed to test the idea that this life cycle, or that a life cycle involving two stages, uh, could underpin one manifestation of the emergence of multicellularity. It's a good point for me to say something I haven't, which is, if you're not aware, that multicellularity has arisen in the order of um, 24, 4, 25 different times it's thought. So it's not improbable to see the evolution of multicellularity. And it's pretty clear, given the different configurations of organisms, that there are probably different pathways uh, and different consequences, actually, of the different starting positions for the evolution of multicellular life. So, this idea that we might embrace the cheats, uh, Caroline Rose and Katrin Hammerschmidt that, that did a, a fantastic job. And this is a tiny snapshot of the, of the many tens of thousands of microcosms that were, that were handled uh, by these two extremely dedicated uh, scientists over the course of five years. So, so far I've only talked about this cheat embracing life cycle. But I'm also going to run, as a control, a cheat purging life cycle. The cheat purging life cycle is much more akin to fragmentation, but let me explain. So in both cases, we start with a sticky cell, produces a mat, and we see the inevitable emergence of the cheat. In the cheat embracing regime, that is taken, and it is now the seed of the next generation of mats. The chief purging regime, which is the more sensible way you might think of running the experiment, is to take the mat forming cell, allow the mat to uh, become a substantive structure. Upon identification of these, these are simply purged, eliminated. And we do, we now, now is the point of difference, back through a single cell bottleneck, but it is here of the same cell type. Here it's a different one, and back around. I'll mention this again when we get to it. So uh, this is the depiction or the shorthand for this life cycle and this life cycle like this. Here, selection is going to see cooperation, the glue, basically, that makes the map. Here it sees glue-forming forming types, but it also sees this other one. And, and, and in fact, selection, if it's going to work on this, has to see both of these types. And in fact, therefore, it has to see a developmental program. It gets to see something new. Here, just is more of the same, but that's jumping ahead. So, first of all, then, the chief embracing regime. Uh, this is how we ensured the life cycle played out. There's two phases, phase one and phase two. Uh, phase one begins with a single cell bottleneck, of the sticky type. It goes into a pristine microcosm where it must um, survive for six days. Now, during this time, cheating cells are going to arise. There are complex uh, frequency-dependent dynamics taking place during the six-day period. 
At the end of the six day period, we harvest the cells, plate, and collect the cheats, the propagules, the non sticky types. They are now pulled from within a single microcosm and used to inoculate the uh, start of phase two, which now just lasts for three days. At the end of the three day period, again, the microcosms are harvested, sticky cells and non sticky cells, and one single sticky cell is taken around and the life cycle begins again. Now, this poses a very significant challenge for these lineages. They can fail, go extinct for a variety of reasons. Uh, if they fail to complete the life cycle, so if the sticky fails to produce the non-sticky or the non-sticky fails to produce the sticky, it's all over. Uh, that's this and this. But they can also fail if there is no visible mat at the end of the six-day period. The, the, the reason for this, it, it's like uh, the, the mat is something uh, akin to soma, the body of the organism. And if the body has fallen in, we've considered that to, a, to be the equivalent of an organism that has died before the age of reproduction. Therefore, there is an extinction. So there's a lot of possibility for death here. Uh, and you will see that here. Persistence is far less than assured, than we would have liked. So these are generations, these nine day phase one, phase two life cycle generations. We started off here with 120 microcosms. Uh, after, after, well, let's cut to the chase. After six generations, they'd all gone extinct. So none of them failed, none of them were able to continue to run this life cycle. Now, of course, there is a happy ending, uh, but this is a very interesting point right off. So the way this experiment was done here, 120 independent lineages, all of them went extinct within six generations. But with some life cycles, some lineages have run six, and it's requiring at least 12 independent mutations. Now, what we haven't allowed in this experimental design is any possibility that selection works among lineages. We've simply taken uh, 120 microcosms, and uh, when they went extinct, that was it. So we never allowed the possibility that a lineage that had persisted, let's say, to, to, through to generation six, was given the chance to export its success. So we could have done that. What I'll tell you about now is, indeed, the regime in which we did allow that to happen. And when we did that, allow that to happen, these life cycles now ran 10 generations, and would have kept on going. So here's, I'll show you this briefly here, and I'll come back to this, because the way that selection worked here uh, is central to understanding the rather surprising result I think that we've got. I won't emphasize the important point at this stage. I'll tell you what we found, and then I'll come back to this. So. The experiment I just mentioned, where everything went extinct by six generations, was 120 microcosms. What we now did is we took those 120 microcosms and we broke them into 15 replicates. And here is one replicate that has eight microcosms in a single rack. These eight lines now persist 10 generations. So remember, I mentioned before that there is uh, plenty of possibility for death. Uh, extinction of a lineage. If the life cycle can't be completed or if the mat collapses early. So here a lineage uh, has gone extinct because the mat has collapsed. So this is a death. It allows a birth process. In this case, this lineage, which has persisted at this time, makes the life cycle, exports its success, it splits. And that process happens elsewhere. Every time there is a death, there is a possibility of a birth. Selection now is operating between groups, the line lineages or the groups themselves are Darwinian. The, 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 the lineages are genetically uh, coherent. Uh, there is no mixing ever between these lineages. For all intents and purposes, these lineages are the equivalent of, a, of, 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 a, of, a, of any old multicellular organism, including us. Uh, so that's how this regime was implemented. The important point here is with and without between group selection, first of all, has a very significant effect on the outcome. And I'm not sure where well, we could talk about this later. I think there's, we've done some math uh, simulating this process. 
there was something in the way lineage selection was implemented here. We implemented between group selection by other regimes as well that we've not yet published, I can talk about later, where we did not see the kind of effect that we saw here. So how selection sees collectives is very much dependent upon well, the ecological circumstances under which the collectives evolve. But I'll come back to more about this in just a moment. Uh, selection here is working on a developmental program, the capacity to run this life cycle. So an evolution biologist does an experiment like this and wants to know whether selection sees the lineages. It ought to, because the lineages are endowed with Darwinian properties by virtue of our control of the environment. So what we do, of course, is to measure the fitness of the derived 10 generation lineages. Non, non, vous ne bougez pas, c'est pas un exercice, c'est simplement de la maintenance. C'est un contrôle obligatoire, mais on n'y échappe pas. Ça dure longtemps so, so we want to know about the fitness of, of, of ancestral and derived. And you know, the expectation is the derived uh, lineages leave more offspring lineages. They are more fit than the ancestral types, at least if they've been seen by selection. So we have uh, ancestor here, derived here. And using genetic markers and so on, we uh, take a one-to-one -one ratio of the ancestor and derived. We allow them to go one through one life cycle generation, and then we count the number of offspring genera uh, offspring mats. So here they started one to one, and after one play through, we see that there are two uh, ancestor and six derived. The derived is more fit than the ancestor. Um, we also, of course, want to know how selection has uh, acted on the individual cells that make up these lineages. So we also obtain various measures of cell level performance. Growth rate of individual cells, doubling time, population density. Uh, and, and in the paper that um, we have a, many different measures of single cell performance. So what did we find there? Well, we found that selection sees the, the lineages, the collectors, and the cells very differently. So after just 10 life cycle generations, uh, the fitness of derived lines increased. So here we have line and cell fitness. Uh, by definition, uh, a fitness of one here would mean that the fitness of the derived had not changed relative to the ancestor. You can see it's gone up significantly. It's certainly saying that selection has seen these collectives, uh, which in a way it should have, but it's good to see. But here is the surprising result. There's at least 2,000 generation of individual cell fitnesses here, and cell fitness has gone down. And it doesn't matter how we measure that. Uh, all measures have gone down. Um, in this particular measure, it's the number of cells in the mat itself, sort of a proxy for the number of cells in the body is one way of getting a measure of fitness. But doubling time, uh, overall density, density of both types, growth rate of both types, sticky and non-sticky, have all gone down. So there is clearly some sort of decoupling right off. Um, fitness here is an emergent, I mean, so it's fitness is an emergent property. It's no longer explained by the fitness of the individual cells. I would argue, and I'll just give you some evidence, that of course we should be able to explain mechanistically the fitness of the collective, but we cannot explain the fitness of the collective based on the fitness of the individual cells. There is a decoupling. Uh, 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 very much a sense here that there is a, you know, a new kind of biological entity that, that, that has emerged here. So this decoupling is... Um, what uh, philosophers and theorists have argued should uh, is, is likely to happen. Indeed, if we look at extant multicellular life, of course, there's no sense that the <coughs> fitness of, of our cells and our, is aligned with our reproductive capacity. And elephants have more cells than mice, uh, but actually elephants leave less offspring than mice. I mean, their de fitness is decoupled. I mean, even gets, I mean, it becomes a very significant philosophical issue of just how we define fitness of 
the cells of our body. I mean, what do you do? You take a cell out and grow it out of context. And even in these experiments, these sorts of issues have come to the fore. Um, but there is a decoupling. I mean, it does seem that, that we've captured something here. So how come? So this is this regime that I showed you. So I, I think it is, understand, it is possible to get a good sense of, of why this decoupling. So this life cycle, not only does it give selection something new to see, a developmental program, and we'll come back to that, more importantly, it allows the possibility that selection begins to work over two time scales. Moreover, the longer time scale stands to trump what's happening in the shorter. And this is the key. So what do I mean? So there are the two time scales, the doubling time of individual cells once every hour, uh, and the doubling time of the collective once every nine days. So in the short term, of course, selection favors mutants that grow fast. But fast growth is, has a high probability of not uh, enhancing the capacity to run the life cycle, which is what matters over the nine-day period. So fast growth in the short term is likely to result in a collective going extinct. So it's those lineages that persist over the nine-day period that have a chance of leaving offspring. So here, persistence means the possibility of a replacement event. It's okay? Yes. Um, uh, so possibly a replacement event. So again, so what you have now, because of this longer, because there is the possibility of death, there's fallibility of the life cycle. Um, uh, selection over that longer time simply trumps those uh, lineages whose individual cells do not cause extinction of the lineage over the nine day period, they win out Any, anyone that fails at, cells that fail the lineage fail the longer time scale <coughs> simply go extinct but this kind of process of course is exactly what one could imagine would give rise to to increasingly uh, an, an alignment of the reproductive interests of the cells with those of the group. Where there is a lack of alignment, those lineages go extinct. They go extinct because there is now a second time scale over which selection can work. And that second time scale is a consequence of this life cycle that is fallible. If the life cycles were not fallible, there would never be this Moran process possible. So again, you know, death, it's often uh, uh, underrated. It's tremendously important. It provides this possibility for selection to work over a longer time scale. Uh, okay. Here, perhaps, I'll just jump ahead. Hey. So we, we have these collectors. They're more fit. Uh, there's this big coupling. What is the mecha mechanistic basis of this? So what are the phenotypic traits that underpin this improvement in the lineage? Um, what we noticed and we measured is that to begin with the life cycle is, is, is highly prone to failure. And after 10 generations of lineage selection, the life cycle is uh, far more reliable. Thick, thicker error, arrows, highly reliable. Uh, Something else that was very noticeable to someone that's used to looking at these wrinkly spread of these colonies is that there's huge variation, as I mentioned before, among wrinkly spread types, among these sticky types. And that, that manifests at the level of a great range of diverse colonies, which you can see easily by eye. After 10 generations, the best lineages who <coughs> ran, took, took the mat forming cells and plated them, they looked like this, run one round, replate, Another round replate, another round replate. The mat forming colon the colonies from the mat forming cells look identical. Now to me that's odd and it smells like some kind of developmental program. To begin with, if you did that experiment, these would all look very, very different. Uh, and indeed, the expectation is that select if, if this life cycle is going to go anywhere, it needs to come under some sort of developmental control. I will just skip ahead here. This is more on the background of how we did it. Um, and I'll just tell you what we found. Uh, well, let's just go straight to this slide. You saw this earlier. Here is, uh, this is a somewhat um, 
simplified version, there are more pathways that were involved. What happened here, though? First mutation causes the map. This would be, again, a function mutation. But again, it overactivates this, it overactivates the glues, it gives this phenotype. The next mutation shuts down this pathway and no longer produces the glue. And this will go on. So the next mutation is up here, now uses a second pathway, recreates this form, and then another mutation shuts it down, and then we move on to this pathway here. Now the interesting thing that happens here, where the significance of you will see in a minute, is this is the Daguan late cyclase, it's activated by this gene, it becomes phosphorylated and it does the business. The next mutation doesn't actually change the phosphorylation status of this, although it still shuts down the phenotype. I'll come back to this. Evolution goes back and uses this pathway again and again and again. Now, here is a stretch of nucleotides that's in the middle of this enzyme here. This is a, di a, di a diguanolate cyclase, making this key signaling molecule. It's making this. That's right in the active site of the enzyme. Now, uh, there are seven Gs in a row. Uh, tracts of nucleotides, homopolymeric tracts are inherently mutable by a process of slip strand and mispairing, but seven Gs is too short to be mutable. However, the next mutation is in this gene here, Matthias. Now, what that does is the, it's a mutation in the mismatch repair enzyme. So the mutation rate goes up about 100 times. Now, we knew this earlier, but well, ah, oh well, not terribly interesting. This whole thing is just driven by an elevated mutation rate. <laughs> but it's not. It's much more interesting than that. And I never would have guessed it. So it turns out... Oh. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> it's tough to guess. It's tough to guess. <laughs> <laughs> it So what happens, and this was a new discovery, actually, our lab and another made it at the same time. So long known that if you get a mutation here, the mutation rate goes up. But it turns out what also happens is that it makes uh, tracts of Gs in particular suddenly prone to, to friendship mutations. So kind of a very interesting issue here too. Get a mutation here, and suddenly the mutational spectrum changes. The tracks of G's now become highly mutable. Tracks of G's are very rare in all organisms. They cause problems in DNA replication. Uh, they're strongly underrepresented. There are something like 30, uh, well, there are four tracks of lengths of seven G's in this genome, six and a half megabases. Uh, it just happens that one of them is here. Anyway, what now happens, thanks to this mutation, we now switch between these two different forms by gaining and losing a nucleotide within this. This destroys the reading frame, recreates it, destroys it, recreates it. And that switches this on and off, and that now moves back and forward by gaining and losing tracks of Gs. It's a simple genetic switch, but it is that. It's a developmental mechanism. Uh, it's crude, but it's certainly effective. Uh, it could easily be subject to further refinement, something that we are now working on. Again, just as a sign for those that know about Matthias and, and mutation rate evolution, this does look something like a pact with the devil. Uh, this uh, lineage gains this remarkable capacity, but it's in a background where the mutation rate is elevated. Most mutations are deleterious, so one would assume a huge genetic load Cruise, but not necessarily. In fact, back of the envelope cal calculations that take into context the ecology or ecological circumstances show that there is huge opportunity for purifying selection. So there is a load of mutations, but those with deleterious mutations are simply eliminated. That bottleneck in particular that these lineages have to go through is, is very important here. Um, okay. So the causative factor. Um, I've made a lot of the life cycle of two different stages and, and already emphasized that selection sees something altogether different when it sees two phenotypes. But it is possible that that's wrong, and 
uh, control is important. So let's get back to the control. So this was the cheat embracing regime that you saw, and now the cheat purging regime that we throw away the cheat. So we get this, which is uh, it's kind of the way that you would think of doing an experiment like this. Cooperation is important. You select on cooperation, you get <coughs> well, what do you do? You get better cooperation, don't you? You don't necessarily get reproduction. So you select on cooperation, you get better cooperation, and all that this is really doing is it's a fragmentation regime uh, between a large number and a single cell, a large number and a single cell, but the, the cell type here and here is exactly the same. And I, I, mean, I kind of already told you that what selection sees is just more of the same. It doesn't get to see anything new. But what do we find? So the same experiment, 10 life cycle generations, measure the fitness of the derived against the ancestor, same regime, fitness of the ancestor, sorry, fitness of the lineage has gone up, as we saw before, but so too has the fitness of the individual cells. So there's no sense of a decoupling having happened here. And no reason to, um, to invoke anything other than improvement in the individual cell performance to explain improvement in the group. <coughs> in fact, here, we, we are very much, much more mechanically involved in reproduction of these collectors than we were in the previous cycle. So some slides by way of perspective. Uh, and maybe I flick over these, and, and, and some of this might be material for discussion. Um, so I emphasized that you know, from single cells to multicellular life, that to my way of thinking, it's how we go from groups that are not necessarily endowed with Darwinian properties to groups with Darwinian properties, that is the key. Um, and here, once there is some capacity for reproduction, there is a possibility of a Darwinian process. So getting to this point seems to be critical. Uh, you know, what you've seen here is, is evidence that fragmentation is not the only one by the way by which nascent collectives might uh, reproduce. Uh, I, I won't dwell on this. Uh, uh, Eric Libby and I published in Physical Biology in 2013 three basic ways by which collectives could reproduce. One is fragmentation, and then there are two other routes. One is what I've described to you, and it's represented by this one. And the other is, is um, well, and both, both these two situations are instances where groups leave group level offspring but they don't do it by fragmentation. They do so by interacting with a cell type that is uh, genetically, must be closely more related or identical, ideally, uh, that acts as the seeds of the next generation. So here, for example, here is our asocial type. We could think of this as a perpetual germline, in fact, that has always existed, single cell type. It gives rise to a group. Uh, if the group simply moves off into space and uh, does not interact with the type that produced it, nothing interesting happens. We just get uh, birth, death, and group, but no connection to fecundity. However, if there is some interaction between the single cell and the collective such that the uh, single cell benefits from being part of this collective, then although the collective dies, so this is the collective, the collective's died here, but the single cells go on and give rise to the collective again. So this is exactly, in this now, that seems all abstract, this is a, a, a female bee that discovers a mutation that allows the production of sterile workers. The sterile workers form a group that dies, it's an evolutionary dead end. The queen, though, goes on and has the capacity to leave the group once again and interacts with the group and benefits with the group. So, you know, this is a classic soma germ distinction. This is a slightly different version of that, but it's what you just saw in my talk. So these kinds of roots by which groups begin to, groups can lead group level offspring, involves two cell types, a group and a single cell type. And uh, they offer some interesting possibilities in terms of you know, evolution of development, evolution of, um, of, of even like a soma germ distinction. I, I perhaps already emphasized and said much of what I want about life cycles and time scales. This two phase life cycle, again, I've said a number of times, it presents selection with something really new. Selection has never seen this before. And that is also, I think, key to seeing the decoupling. Decoupling is never going to happen if the collective and the cells have interests aligned as they do in our cheat purging regime. Um, 
you know, e each different state. So selection cannot just see this, and it cannot just see this. It has to see the, the totality of this. The newness is a developmental program. Uh, that's what allows, well, it sets the, the second time scale at which selection can work, and that allows the possibility of the decoupling. The selection over that longer term will trump selection working in the short term. In the short term, those cells that grow fast and kill the group, that's the end of that lineage. Those cells that increasingly align themselves with the reproductive fate of groups succeed. And it's that sort of process that includes, I view, the newborn building a new evolution of development. Now, the rules of development increasingly align the interests of cells with those of the collective. Said enough of that. And I've also said that you know, this single phase life cycle really does offer very limited possibilities for decoupling or for the emergence of anything new. Selection is simply working on more of the same. Uh, well, there are many perspectives here on levels of selection. I, I really won't say anything more. Uh, it's an interesting debate. I've definitely offered a perspective that is multi level. I can certainly see perspectives that don't bring on a multi-level component, uh, including the possibility that may wish, one may wish to explain this all at the level of the individual cell or the individual gene. But of course, I wouldn't let you away with that. You would have to go further and explain it at the level of the individual quark. And then I would turn around and say, well, what have we learned? I think this multi-level possibility is useful because of what it stands to tell us about the biology of the systems. Uh, in the uh, supplement to the paper, we did a, effectively a contextual analysis, uh, looking to see if we could assign improvements to, to collectors or individual cell properties. I won't go over that, but if you wish we, we could look at that, but that provides quite a strong argument that, that in our life cycle regime, the traits that improved were never those of individual cells, they were the switch rate. The switch rate was itself a product of selection working at the level of collectors. Uh, again, one can go on, and maybe I just finish this by saying that what we really have here at the end of this experiment, I think, is something quite surprising. Uh, we have a, an organism, uh, or from any perspective, a, a new multicellular life form. Uh, what makes it multicellular? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, but I think often we might come and point to a reproductive division of labor as something that is a hallmark. So here, we do have that. Um, we have a cell type that produces a mat, performs an ecologically important role, getting oxygen. Uh, at the same time, it must produce the seeds of the next generation. And some of the, one of these lineages, at least, that we've looked at has evolved the capacity to do that via a developmental mechanism. One cell type does two things. There is a reproductive division of labor. And that is well understandable within the levels of selection perspective. Um, <coughs> I will just say one more thing here, switching to what I've been doing in Ospicy. Uh, because it's an extension of the logic of Darwinism and the way it can work on collectives. Uh, and a recognition that in the experiment that, we, that I've just recounted, uh, that ecology is the thing that is so is critical to the emergence of these life cycles. And it's ecology that's so often limiting. Um, so I think you know, transitions, these major evolution transitions have been rare in nature, uh, primarily because the ecological conditions that bring them about are rare. Uh, and I increasingly think that. I, I used to think it was probably genetic, but I think it's ecology. Um, and what we can do in vitro, it's an awful lot of work, but some new technologies allow the possibility for us to impose those Darwinian properties at the level of collectors, where the collectors themselves have no idea that they're evolving as collectors. What do I mean? But here are these sort of, uh, some of you may have seen these droplet technologies available. Uh, through, um, uh, well, An Andrew Griffiths at Ospice, Jérôme Babette. These are tiny little droplets, picoliter sizes, uh, you know, 30 to 50 picoliters, produced at the rate of, of, of um, 20,000 droplets a second. So you can get huge populations of droplets, uh, put single cells in these, and you can grow them up. 
you know, tens instead of 120 microcosms, you have 20 million microcosms that are droplets. These tiny little droplets, though, are very small and very difficult to get things to grow in. But these droplets here, uh, sort of a mini fluidic technology, are in the hundreds of nanometer range. So we can grow populations of microbes to 10 to the 6 or so in here. What you can see, um, so you see large, small, large, small. You go back and forward as they do in real life. The large is a spacer of air. The small is a 300 nanoliter drop of media. Uh, it's in a Teflon tubing. And surrounding the air plug and the liquid culture is a fluorinated oil. And this is maintained in constant um, movement. So in, instead of microcosms, we have these small droplets here. Uh, I'll skip over that. So here's what I mean. Here is a set of entities, a uh, you know, community of cells, let's say. Well, you know, we can put a boundary around those communities, and you know, why can't we call those a group? Why not? Um, but the, you know, the Darwinism part, well, these groups need to vary, they need to reproduce, and there needs to be heritability. But of course, we can uh, bring about reproduction. We can even allow selection to work. For some reason, this, this group here is going to die and that other group is going, to be is going to reproduce, and it simply splits in two. So we can split these droplets. So if we suddenly saw a, a group reproduce, it's not doing it. We are doing it. So here we are imposing reproduction. Heredity needs to follow, and that's an interesting one. But that process can go on uh, with the you know, extinction uh, and splitting. We can operate selection on lineages. Uh, what will happen, I think, at this stage, uh, the, the, the Darwinian property that is to emerge here is that of heredity. If these are mixtures of cells, if these are communities, the question is, how does heredity move? Well, I think this process will favor, it will select for interactions. Where there is an interaction will mean the parental droplet will most closely resemble, sorry, the offspring droplet will close, more closely resemble the parental droplet. And that process run on through ought to build strong interactions and even, you know, this is a bit of a push, but if I'm right about ecological <coughs> conditions being limiting, then it's possible that we might see you know, the recreation of endosymbiotic events and so on, you know, an extreme interaction that, faith, uh, that fixes the reproductive fates of cells. Uh, here is the evolution machine in which this happens, and what it allows us to do is to take a population of droplets uh, which over uh, some period of time uh, change as a consequence of the of evolution taking place in each droplet. Selection, natural or artificial, can now be imposed at this time point here. Uh, these three here go extinct, and the brighter ones here are chosen for reproduction. So a process of lineage selection. These droplets now participate as units of selection in an evolutionary process in their own right. And they do it by virtue of our control. Uh, of, of ecology. And once again, what we have here is two time scales. What happens over the longer time scale determines the success or failure of the groups. So, so you know, evolution is working at the level of the individual doubling time of particles, but it also operates over the period at which droplets are reproduced. So there is a second time scale, which again I think is so important. But what it does is it takes away selection from outright growth rate. Much of our work into experimental evolution selects on growth rate. There's little opportunity for anything else. But much of the interesting stuff that happens in evolution takes place when selection no longer works on outright growth rate. But how selection works on something other than outright growth rate is often difficult to see. It comes quite naturally when there is a second time scale. So there is the possibility there, I think, for interesting things to happen. Here are simply a, a couple of movies of the, of the machine in action. So this is loading the train of droplets here. Uh, uh, you'll see this again in a moment. So that's establishing the train of droplets. Uh, the droplets are now in about 10 meters of Teflon. This is not moving, but this is the droplets moving through the Teflon tubing. Uh, after a period of time, the droplets get to the end, and then they move back the other way. In between those two cylinders, uh, the, the tubing is continuous, and each drop goes in front of a lens, uh, uh, a fluorescent um, uh, LED, and we can detect, uh, extract information on what's going on in each droplet. And that could be a mixture of types, so uh, it could be more or less anything you want. So you have an ordered set of microcosms, um, well mixed, 
uh, from which uh, data is extracted. So here we have a set of droplets that are not inoculated, a set of, set of droplets that are inoculated, and this is simply the time course data from hundreds of those microcosms. So one can see what's going on, and on the basis of the phenotypes, uh, decide who lives and who dies. Uh, uh, so here, this is just to show that the sipper now spits. So these are these are droplets that are have been chosen to reproduce. So they've been spat into a microtiter plate where they're diluted. And now the train is re-established. So maybe you know, this well here contains a droplet that is going to leave two, three, you know, we decide, offspring droplets. So there'll be two sips from the same well if one droplet is to leave two offspring, however you wish to do it. And that re-establishes uh, the train of droplets. So, there we are, that, that is something of, a, of, of an aside. The same extension of the logic of Darwinism to collectors. Here, actually taking it to a, a really artificial state where we can control uh, all aspects of, of ecology. What's left to evolve, of course, is again the nature of these interactions. Um, and I think, I think again, this transition to multicellular life is intimately linked to, to the origin of life cycles. And this sets us long in time. Uh, there are a lot of interesting possibilities. The origin of development must come about at the same stage. One of the reasons I think that life goes through a single cell bottleneck is because of what it does for, in terms of discretizing variation. And that generates a much more potent machine. But the moment, of course, a population of a multicellular organism goes, a nascent one goes through a bottleneck, it's great in terms of what selection sees, because the next variation is both purged of conflicts and, and it's a genetically pure lineage. But that single cell now faces the challenge of recreating the ancestral the multicellular type, which is going to potentially work if the, there is a real ecological benefit for the, for the multicellular type. So you know, the origins of life cycles, soma germ distinctions, development, all the big things, I think, seem to possibly come together very early on uh, in the way that these groups emerge. Uh, and some acknowledgments I mentioned, Katrin and Caroline. Katrin is now back in Germany. Uh, Caroline's just had a second baby. <laughs> Uh, Eric, a uh, mathematician uh, at Santa Fe, Yuri uh, uh, just finished his PhD, he's now in Germany, Ben Kerr at uh, University of Washington, Silvio de Monte at Ecole Normale, uh, Jonas Korlak, who is at Pac Bio, who helped us out a great deal with uh, provision of the sequencing, Little Jerome Bibet and, and colleagues at LCMD, uh, with whom we've been doing the mini fluidic work. So thank you, and I'm very happy. Thank you.